Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out to this talk. I'm Yang Amber Lee, Assistant Professor of Economics from the School of Business and Management at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I'm also faculty associate <coughs> of uh, IEMS, Institute of Emerging Market Studies. Uh, today, we are delighted to return to the EY Central Office to continue our Emerging Market Insights series, which are presented by HKUST IEMS co-organized by uh, HKUSD Institute for Public Policy and also Center of Economic Development, sponsored by E1, in order to provide the thought leadership on important issues on emerging markets. Today, I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Professor Keith Masters. Uh, Keith is an arts and science professor of distinction and also professor of economics at the University of Colorado, Boulder, USA. He was also previously chief economist at the US uh, Department of the State, where he led the research and uh, analysis, uh, analysis on a very wide range of the topics on um, uh, international economics and security topics, which are very important for the US uh, foreign policies. He was also the lead economist of the World Bank uh, in the past. He also serves as a consultant uh, for the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and also the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, his current research focused on the international economic uh, aspects of the in uh, protecting intellectual property rights which is a very key and sensitive issue in today's tension between U.S. and China. Right? Um, now today he will speak to us about the U.S. trade policies and also the U.S.-Asian trade relationship. Now let's welcome Keith. Thank you, uh, everyone, and especially my thanks to Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and to UI. And it's, uh, it's very nice to be here. I come to Hong Kong often, but uh, I don't think I've ever had this view before, so it's really great. I'll be looking out there <laughs> while trying to convince you a few things. Um, so when I was uh, invited to come to Hong Kong and give a talk over at HKUST, uh, they also uh, then asked me to try to say a few words about, about this topic. Uh, which I'm, I'm happy to do. Uh, I know it's an extremely uh, important uh, and timely topic in this part of the world, but so it is uh, in the United States as well. So um, what I think that I will uh, try to do is, uh, is, is offer some, some comments that are mostly focused on what seems to be going on in the United States and whether the situation in the United States is more permanent or more temporary. Now in saying that, and, and then talk what, about what it might mean for, for this part of the world, but in saying that, I do want to let you know a few things. Uh, first of all, about being the chief economist of the State Department, I, I was uh, in that position for a year through October of last year. Um, so uh, one of the few economics officials in the first year of the Trump administration. Um, but as you probably have heard, uh, the State Department has been under some stress. <laughs> and among other things, what that means is there are no economists left at the State Department any longer, or scientists or technologists either. So it's a, it's, it's a little difficult to, to tell you these days what may be going on uh, in that context. And then I should be very clear that any comments I make today are my opinion uh, as a private citizen of the United States. Uh, you shouldn't take anything I say as a reflection of public policy in the United States whatsoever. Um, or had I been here six months ago, that would be a different story. All right, so you've all seen the headlines from then-candidate and now President Trump. 
know if you have seen this one. This is from 2015. I'll just let you read this. Uh, but it is, without question, uh, part of the driving uh, impetus going on in, uh, in the Trump administration these days, with respect especially to China. Now, that was a campaign stick. So keep that in mind. And overstated. But we have the Trans Pacific Partnership as another disaster done and pushed by special interests. If you know the rest of that quote, it gets pretty salty, as we say in English. So, um, NAFTA is the worst trade deal we've ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed by this country. This country meaning the United States. Um, and trade wars are good. <laughs> I suspect that particular quote was not uh, vetted by the State Department. There it is. So this is really a very aggressive, in your face kind of dialogue or, or dialogue, unilateral conversation going on uh, in Washington these days. Um, and it, there's no question that it concerns a great many people there, and be more there than here, I'll say uh, a fair amount about this pushback that's going on in the United States now. Before getting that there, what about some of the policy pronouncements that, uh, that has come out of the administration? Well, you know, the U.S. withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. First thing the Trump administration did was to announce its withdrawal from the TPP. Uh, I actually was recruited to the State Department by the prior administration, and uh, part of what I was going to be working on was uh, working with Congress to actually get the United States into the final stages of the TV. So there was some significant shock in Washington uh, when the election came out the way it did, in this context at least. So the administration announced uh, in May of 2017 a study of the sources of bilateral trade deficits and the effects of unfair trade practices. That study uh, it was written, I believe, but uh, I don't know that it's ever been released. Of course, the US, Mexico, and Canada at, at the American insistence launched a renegotiation of NAFTA in August. That is still going on. And the administration threatened to withdraw from the Korea-U.S. trade agreement in September, but uh, there was some minor renegotiation of that one. Uh, and maybe the most uh, significant one that gets the least number of headlines, uh, the U.S. investment rebody called CDIUS, or CDIUS, uh, surely is intervening more now to block technology acquisitions. The most famous one, of course, being just last month, uh, with Broadcom and Qualcomm arrangements being blocked by cities. Um, and, you know, pretty much entirely on the grounds of national security and loss of sensitive technology. Section 202, the National Security Steel Aluminum Tariffs announced in March 2018. This is a very significant uh, element of trade policy, not, not only because of the tariffs themselves, but because national security. Uh, as a motivation or justification for, for unilateral tariff setting, well, anywhere, in the United States or elsewhere, has pretty much uh, been taken off the table by the WTO agreements. Uh, and so this is, this is, in fact, a change in the norms from a pretty significant dimension. The administration announced uh, an intention to impose tariffs, as you all know very well, on $60 billion of Chinese imports under Section 301. So the administration has also resurrected Section 301, the, uh, the unfair trade practices part of administrative policy. Um, and again, that is something that has not been uh, undertaken by the United States uh, during the WTO period until this case. Um, the, idea, the idea being that Section 301, defining unilaterally what is an unfair international trade practice, should have been given deference to the WTO, uh, but the Trump administration thinks that's not significant or not enough uh, in terms of the toolbox that the Americans have. So this, of course, regards China, is, is in regards to China's restrictions on investment, uh, ownership, joint venture requirements, 
intellectual property, its treatment, technology transfer restrictions, and, and all of those things that you're familiar with. Um, and those tariffs, uh, as you know, have not been implemented. There's this sort of tit-for-tat set of threats going back and forth these days. Uh, we'll know in another month or so uh, what will happen there. Well, no matter how you slice it, <clears throat> that's an impressive record of announcements, if uh, not always implemented, or even very often implemented, into actual policies. Uh, but it does suggest a real change in, in rhetoric and approach to international trade. And I wouldn't say uh, it's entirely aimed at China or Asia by any means. I mean, Canadians and Mexicans are wondering you know, what happened to their world uh, early on in the administration. Uh, and the Europeans, of course, are <coughs> to these steel tariffs until there will be exceptions from the steel tariffs. So, uh, so this is uh, not, not uh, by any means targeted anywhere other than uh, thinking that the United States needs to be more aggressive about international trade. Which, for me, raises an interesting question, which is, is this a one-off administrative change? Uh, or are the American people really themselves turning inward? Uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about Brexit, for example, in, in the UK as an example of, of uh, populations getting tired of sort of the trade arrangements being imposed upon them and immigration rules that come from abroad. Uh, and so there was some, uh, some dis dissatisfaction in Britain about their situation. So is that the same thing in the United States? Uh, is, is an excellent question, and I'll, I'll talk you through how I see it. Wrong about this. Um, so how much does this policy trend reflect U.S. voter attitudes? This is a very complex question. And it's often caught up in debates about deep American political divisions that you may have heard of. I'll say a few things about that in a moment. But if I can show you something that might interest you, I'll come back to um, So let's just go through the conventional anti-trade wisdom, which, which has a lot of truth to it. There's no doubt about it. Many American households, in particular regions, have suffered economic stagnation uh, for a long time. And so recently, there has been very little growth in average household real income for the bottom 60% of U.S. households, which is to say, um, in 1978 or 9, uh, you were in the bottom 60% of American households. Your real income would be the same as it is today. Uh, even accounting for sort of quality improvements in products and so on. I mean, that's a pretty extraordinary event, if you think about that. Um, that's a lot of people who think that they've seen the world grow, but, but haven't themselves really participated as much in this. Trade is seen widely as a source of the sharp rise in inequality that we're all familiar with. Might be wrongly, that's a common perception. And of course, there have been major job losses in manufacturing and other blue collar work. Um, the chart was up there a second ago, but uh, from the peak in 1979 to the drop in 2010, uh, 8 million jobs in manufacturing in the United States disappeared now. Um, started to come back, and a lot of people sort of uh, attribute that to, to the Trump administration. Um, whether that is a fair attribution or not is, is an interesting question. I mean, the economic growth that's been going on is really why that's being true, but uh, you, can, you can tell a lot of political stories here. And maybe even more important, many locations suffered from pretty severe dislocation uh, from this import competition. So I went, just to give an example, uh, to, to an undergraduate college in a small western town in the state of Illinois right in the middle of the country. Uh, when I was there as, as a college student in the late 1970s, it was a manufacturing center of considerable importance. Uh, but now there are no factories left there. Uh, the city is, is really quite devastated. Um, and people you know, they look for reasons to, to, to blame for this. And international trade is certainly uh, one of them. And trade coming from China is uh, certainly at the top of that list. So as I say, it's easy to describe these problems to offshoring, emergence of production networks, and import growth from China. Uh, if I could give you another little anecdote. Um, sometime a few years ago, my wife and I were out shopping for dishwashers, I recall, and she was deep in negotiations with the guy who was selling us the dishwasher. So I went around looking. 
and all of the little tags and all of the appliances in the store. I think it was a target. Every one of them, without exception. I was able to see it made in China. So I commented on this to uh, the guy who was selling this dishwasher. He needed someone to apologize for this. I said, no, 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 need to apologize. I understand this. But uh, you, you can see this is uh, quite something. So uh, I'm sorry I was talking about in terms of manufacturing. Well, continuing this conventional wisdom, it's also, uh, this isn't going to surprise anybody, but a really startling emergence of massive trade deficits in the United States since the late 1990s. So if I could just give you some visual representation of this. Until the uh, mid-1990s, the United States trended towards trade deficits, but they were small, relatively small as a percentage of GDP. Nothing that anybody would pay any attention to. And here we are, beginning uh, in the late 90s and certainly accelerating during the period just after China joined the WTO again. So, a correlation that may not mean much, but you understand, uh, to this massive increase in, in, this, in this trade deficit in, in merchandise. Um, and it's continued up and down through the recession and everything since then. But the point is, this is a challenge to economists to explain, and we haven't done a very good job of explaining that. There's sort of half a dozen hypotheses out there. One of them is that China generated the WTO, and maybe it really was. The combination of the competitiveness of Chinese exports along with the ability of Asian economies to invest in the states of financial resources that drove this massive increase in the trade deficit and the uh, current and so whether you want to think of this in economic terms or you want to think about this as just a matter of politics, it's inescapable, right? It's just inescapable that that has been a big change. And of course, there's been a corresponding rise in U.S. trade with China from $84 billion just before they joined the WTO to about $375 billion last year. That's two-thirds of the American trade business. Now, I think if you understand what drives these kinds of macroeconomic imbalances, this is a really poor way to think about trade policy. Um, and in fact, if you try to measure what the real trade imbalance between the United States and China is, you would first uh, worry about the services part of the current account. And of course, we have a fairly large service surplus in China. That brings the trade imbalance down. And then, and then if you think about the value added implicit in trade, that probably drops this trust at another 30 or 40 percent. So really the true imbalance is maybe half this measured size. Uh, try telling that to a reporter it's you know, what you get. Okay? This is really uh, an issue of optics more than the actual economics of it. All this feeds the narrative that China is sustaining unfair trade practices. I think that view is overestimated in the public's mind, but there's certainly quite a bit of evidence for it. And then finally, uh, we have conflicting stories in the United States among the public about gains and losses from major trade agreements such as NAFTA. So NAFTA advocates will tell you that the United States has gained massively from this integration of the economies. The automobile sector certainly believes that. It's a much more efficient sector because of its ability to generate North American production networks. Um, advocates or opponents of NAFTA will tell you that, in fact, there's been massive job loss, which is part of the Trump campaign. Economists might helpfully say is that NAFTA has maybe increased American GDP by one half of one percent over 30 years, in which case you think, okay, this is a little hard for us to, to, to be real positive about. Uh, and as with Brexit, there seems to be a growing dissatisfaction with and distrust in remote policy elites like trade negotiators and the World Trade Organization and TPP. Um, the uh, U.S. Trade Representative is, is on record many times these days as saying uh, that, that it's a mistake to allow the United States to have WTO rules in the view of our sovereign ability to make policy, no matter what that policy is. So that's a big question. And then finally, what do complex regulatory issues in these modern trade agreements like intellectual property rights, investment services, liberalization achieve to ordinary citizens? Um, not a lot, probably. So this is my last set of comments about this question about American people turning inward. How true is all of this conventional wisdom? That's what you hear about Brexit, that's what you hear about Marshall Western Europe, that's what you hear now about the United States. Um, 
Going into the 2016 presidential election, the majority of Americans were actually quite pro-trade. Let me show you this. The dark green line is the answer, positive answer. Do you think foreign trade is an opportunity for the United States or a cost to the United States? And 58% is the highest that number's ever been. That was in 2016. And there's no evidence of any kind of decline since that time. And in terms of actual opposition to trade, it's actually been going down in recent years. So that's a bit of a puzzle. And the same thing is true about attitudes towards legal immigration in the United States. In fact, the top diagram on the left, that the share of Americans, about 59% in 2016, who thinks who think that legal immigration is a benefit for the American economy is at its highest level ever. So what we have is the conventional wisdom that suggests Americans are turning in one direction and polling results that suggest it's not clear whether that's true or if it's true exactly why they're doing that. So, What might be going on? What's changed? Well, political opinions in the United States, uh, at, like elsewhere, have become highly polarized, perhaps more than at any time since the 1930s. And I'm sure you've read a bit about this, but if you were in the United States, you would, uh, you would recognize it immediately by going on social media, watching various different kinds of uh, news, uh, and uh, from hearing commentators. They're everywhere on television all the time making uh, lots of claims that are probably not true. But to oversimplify these differences, rural towns and manufacturing areas that have experienced economic hardship are feeling stress. Urban centers with rapid growth and booming employment think the trade is wonderful. There are more people there. And so that's why the uh, support for trade is fairly clear. Lower educated blue collar workers uh, under, again, employment and income stress versus higher education professionals who thrive with technological change. Religious and social conservatives versus lifestyle progressives. And finally, younger voters who are largely more open to technology, trade, and immigration versus older voters. And in the United States, as in elsewhere, older voters vote at a much higher percentage than younger voters. So, these attitudes don't necessarily get translated into politics. But just to give you a sense of this, if you look at the diagram on the bottom on the left, uh, this is, again, attitudes towards uh, the benefits of immigration. And the blue line, essentially, are what we call blue voters in the United States. They come from uh, Democratic, Democratic states. And they're up there at 78%. Whereas the red line, is what we would call Republican leaning voters, and their opinion about immigration is very negative. So there is this polarization going on that's partly political, but it's driven by all kinds of geographical and economic purposes. Uh, it's quite important. And this one over here has to do with age differential. Again, this is about uh, uh, immigration, attitudes towards immigration. The youngest people in the United States are very pro immigration, whereas the younger people are, are not. And so consequently, uh, younger people don't vote so much. Uh, that's a big part of this issue. Uh, but it does suggest that there is reason to pause and think about whether there really is this inward turn in politics, or at least in, in the opinion in the United States. Okay. So some implications. And then I will get on the trade issues. Political polarization, at least in the United States, but I think this is generally true, generates fragmentation political interests and candidates. So it's quite possible to have skeptics about trade, immigration, mobilization to be in the minority. But if it's a strongly held minority, uh, opinion among a large enough minority of voters, and they have a high turnout, you can certainly get a kind of outcome we had in 2016. And it correlates with wider health concerns, distrust of elites, exhaustion of the policy stagnation in, the, in, in Congress, concerns about inequality, and so on. So all of this led to a greater acceptance of the Trump campaign platform for just a different approach, not just about trade, although we're re rebalancing trade as a big part of the campaign, but about, about uh, how Congress is supposed to work. There's 
the interaction among individuals within social media and all kinds of issues that came up. So and I would say his election may have been unique, but it was it wasn't random. Uh, there was an appetite for change in the United States, even among some of these blue state voters. Okay. So that background, this fragmentation and so on, let me turn to at least my view of, of what seems to be going on. One of the principles that animate trade policy in the Trump administration is, again, this is my opinion. I was in the administration for a while, but, but what I'm telling you is, is, is my opinion based on reading experience. This is not a statement about anything formal in the US government. So, what is this new approach to trade? As seen chaotic, I imagine if you followed it. And going on, you see that it's pretty chaotic. It changes day to day. But uh, nevertheless, there are some principles, some pillars, that we can think of as America first that seem to drive this. One, national security interests do take precedence over trade relations. Uh, there's no formal statement of that. That's my sense of it. Uh, from having uh, been involved in some discussions and, and reading about this. Uh, and that's important. That's very important because it means that uh, trade policy can be undertaken in a context that is subordinate to international relations or national security issues. Competition for technological leadership uh, is about both national security and future market shares in leading industries. This is a a big issue in Washington, and it's hardly just the Trump administration. Pretty much all of the uh, of official Washington believes that China is engaging in mercantilist technological industrial policy, and uh, it's probably not after time or beyond time when China needs to be confronted about this. Um, everybody in Washington who's involved in trade reads this document from Beijing called Made in China 2025, familiar with it. It sets out this blueprint for the industries that China intends to dominate by 2025, which, of course, are exactly those industries the Americans currently think that they have a substantial need in. Uh, and so there's a lot of concern about, about what this might mean. U.S. manufacturing and mining workers have paid too much in the minds of some uh, of the burden of globalization and need protection. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to argue against these points because if you're a steel worker and you've lost your job because of excessive capacity in steel production in the world, a lot of it coming from China, there are reasons to be uh, unhappy about the way things are going. One corollary here uh, is that to shorten supply chains by bringing assembly operations and manufacturing back to the United States is it's actually a goal. It's not a cost. Now, the economists would say this is inefficient, it's going to be costly, and you know, there are columns by economists, uh, hundreds of them, uh, about NAFTA. And saying, in fact, uh, if, in, if, if, if there are some significant tightening of the rules of origin in, in NAFTA that bring the supply chains back into the United States from Mexico, this is really quite costly. Uh, and I think many in the Trump administration would react to that positively. Trade agreements uh, and the multilateral system uh, place too many constraints on US policymaking and not enough on countries that maybe don't follow the rules. You see, again, this is uh, aimed at China. And finally, I guess there's one more. The rules-based approaches of past administrations uh, to particularly uh, China, but, but other countries as well, uh, was ineffective at changing behavior. Um, so now maybe confrontation and uncertainty will achieve better results. And six, the U.S. can negotiate better bilateral trade agreements, including in Asia, than regional deals. Now, I, I would say, again, just my view, this is sort of a set of principles, such as they are, about what is uh, at the bottom of, of current U.S. trade policy. So you can certainly look at those and think that they amount to a strategic new vision. There's nothing terribly new about a lot of it when um, you think about it. But uh, its implementation so far has, has been more bluster than actual intervention. We don't see a lot of actual intervention except in the steel movement of tariffs. But even there, uh, there's so many exceptions now to them. Uh, it's become a transactional issue more than an actual trade policy issue. So it can work. Uh, some arguments, uh, pro and con. And then uh, 
get into the international relations kind of questions. So there are some promising ideas here, some potential advantages from this approach. Modernizing some of the old trade agreements, uh, NAFTA, for example, uh, has been overdue for some time. NAFTA was written at a time when this was before e-commerce, before digital trade, and, and many, many other things that uh, could be done better in this context. Um, now, that's not entirely, or even maybe very much, what the Trump administration is hoping to achieve in NAFTA. There's some other things that they're after as well. But, you know, rethinking some of these issues, not so bad. And maybe raising pressure, even if it's unilateral on the WTO, uh, might unlock some of the really rigid positions there. The WTO has become almost irrelevant. It really hasn't had any success in the international negotiations in a long, long, long time, for lots of reasons. But partly it's about the positions that different countries take at the WTO, and it just, just prevents uh, uh, progress altogether. And so maybe even raising this pressure, but also you know, working with China in this context, could set the stage for advancing that system. And then the big one, I think, uh, older attempts to open markets and restrain industrial policy, especially in China, may bear more fruit than prior attempts at, at, at achieved. I don't know. This is a big family. This is a, this is a situation where policy that may be undertaken is literally a gamble. Trying to get some change in the attitudes and the policy stance uh, of what is seen as a technological competitor uh, sooner rather than later. If, if it's successful, it probably would benefit both countries. And a lot of what the United States is trying to do is to open up a lot of the Chinese market to new services, to investment, and so on. I can tell you that this strategy is pretty popular in the United States. And, and even among economists and business uh, individuals who are willing to talk about it, uh, probably. You'll see that uh, the view is that you know, China has been playing in this context uh, a pretty one-sided uh, strategy that uh, has been costly. Uh, so in this context, if it's really about strategic trade policy, then some other big country needs to get involved uh, and change the payoffs that uh, are seen in, in, in Chinese government. And maybe this will work. I mean, this is, this is in essence what, what the strategy the risky the gamble is. I don't know that you would get anybody in motion to put in those terms, but effectively everybody's hoping that that's what comes up. But disadvantages, questionable ideas. Uh, I do think that Trump's, uh, the administration's trade policy has been to, so far somewhat misplaced and, uh, and based on poorly informed policy ideas, and that's not sustained. It really isn't. So some examples here. This emphasis on bilateral trade imbalances as a measure of unfair trade is ideological, not analytical. Canada escaped because its bilateral trade that was surplus in the United States was under ten billion dollars. Mexico's was over ten billion dollars, so Mexico is an unfair trader, Canada isn't. It's an odd way to think about international trade policy. It irritates trading partners. So this is sort of a misguided focus on outcomes rather than actual market access, which is, which is the goal. Temporary trade protection is not likely to help industries that need to deal with long-term structural problems. So the US really needs policies to address bigger problems. The fact that we don't generate enough skills, we don't train a lot of workers well enough to, to thrive in this kind of economy, uh, and all of the adjustment problems in the United States. These are structural problems that we should be investing in a big way, and, and I don't see much of that yet. And then because of NAFTA, because of the Korean uh, arrangement that was sort of disrupted, I think countries have become leery of bilateral negotiations in the United States. You probably have seen what the Japanese have been saying about whether they're willing to do a bilateral deal in the United States, which is coming uh, forward future in the for, for much long, longer in the United States with some, some, some real intent to try to convince the Japanese to provide their arrangement. I'm not sure that that will come about. Um, and the administration seems intent on trade and trade policy as a series of transactions to be negotiated, not a real strategy. Uh, so if that's the case, then I don't know that it can work terribly well. And finally, many objectives I think would be better achieved by cooperating with other major economies, similar concerns. So two big examples, both in North China, there's the overcapacity of steel. Uh, the OECD has been working on this issue for a long time. 
I'm not sure that unilateral imposition of steel tariffs by the United States will deal with that capacity problem, um, but some coordinated arrangement might have. And then there's the, the issue of Chinese high tech industrial policy. Uh, you know, so when I was uh, talking to people in Brussels, uh, often they would say, this is important. We would like to partner with you on this kind of question. And finally, the failure to leave trade policy with international relations, in my mind at least, is short sighted. So the pulling out of the TPP was a mistake on many levels. I mean, it was just market access. Agriculture was a big deal in that arrangement. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen again. But the whole thing about the United States pulling out of this major trade agreement that, that really uh, will set the terms of competition in Asia for some, for a generation at least, uh, was remarkably. Uh, So, these problems suggest that elements of the strategy may be unsustainable. Uh, so, we're getting a pushback now. The Trump administration has discovered that the U.S. business community generally opposes significant trade barriers or changes in trade agreements. Just a few examples the exclusions from steel and aluminum tariffs I already mentioned. The remaining targeted import flows, I think. Japan and Turkey are the two countries remaining, uh, and China, a small amount of U.S. exports. Um, that's a very small percentage of U.S. imports that had been targeted by these tariffs. So I don't really know how this is going to uh, end up protecting the American steel industry. Automobile sectors uh, pushing back hard in that, though, as I already mentioned, agricultural export interests opposing uh, the potential lost market access in Mexico and in China. Uh, and they remain upset with losing Japanese markets uh, in the TPP. So, yes, we'll find out in November in the United States with the midterm elections uh, whether this gamble is paying off as a matter of politics as opposed to international relations. Okay, we still remain in a situation of flux and uncertainty about what will happen and why. So if I'm sitting in another country capital wondering what American trade policy is all about, uh, I don't know, I read the paper like everyone else. So with all of these headwinds, to me, uh, and this is sort of where I'm moving with this long stuff on the United States, with all of these headwinds, it seems to me unlikely that the Trump administration can sustain a protectionist agenda, push it very far, or keep it going for very long. That means that uh, what we call routine trade policy is likely to revert to standard trade management. And I don't mean cases, subsidy cases, WTO complaints, maybe some occasional safeguards tariffs, which I think uh, in the end, uh, and I think sooner rather than later, it's going to be largely indistinguishable from trade policy uh, in prior administrations. But some of these newer elements are going to remain, and they will be inherited, I think, in this part of the world, even after the Trump so it would be a mistake, I think, to conclude uh, from anything I've said or anything that's been written that, that even though the Trump approach, administration approach to trade policy is transactional, it's kind of chaotic, uh, it varies from time to time, place to place, and product to product, there are some underlying issues that really do animate lots of people. So whoever becomes uh, the next president, and they continue to be the Trump administration for another four years, um, there will be issues that remain after the Trump administration. And you can think of this, it's not my phrase, someone else's, as conditional cooperation, which simply means that in some key areas, further cooperation with the United States is likely to be conditioned on positive responses in key countries, most importantly China. So enhanced investigations and caution about foreign takeovers of US-based technology companies and facilities. Uh, it's going to become increasingly difficult for Chinese enterprises, especially state-owned enterprises, to acquire American technology. And not just in terms of just buying American technology companies, but also greenfield investment uh, in technologies, also uh, having access to sensitive exports. I think we'll see. Uh, on the increase in the export control regime. 
And you may even see China-specific or state-owned enterprise-specific guidelines within CPS version. Uh, and I suspect, again, strictly my opinion, that this will not happen only in the United States. You may see this in Europe as well, and in Canada, and in Japan, and in Australia. Uh, because there is a generalized concern that, that, that these technologies uh, are human use technologies, it's about security, it's also about the future of the technologically oriented economy, uh, and maybe we're selling these to the future in that sense. The greater tendency toward reciprocal treatment of high tech investment restrictions. You know, the president has said this many times we can't invest in China, maybe we're just going to make a reciprocal arrangement here, they can't invest in the United States. I don't think we're anywhere near that situation, but I do think you might see. Uh, greater tendency towards reciprocal arrangements or reciprocal guidelines around high-tech investment restrictions. Uh, and then active and more forceful engagement with China to try to get a more balanced playing field in these technology sectors. Um, you know, active and forceful kind of means what they're doing now. And you may see uh, bilateral or regional negotiations on elements of key U.S. interests becoming more uh, prominent in the region, data protection, e-commerce, intellectual property, already very prominent issues. I do think, from the standpoint of American high technology companies, the United States having taken itself out of TPP was really problematic because all of those things existed in the TPP, such as it was. Uh, some of the IP agreement, rules have been scaled back, some of the e-commerce stuff has been changed, and some of the investment stuff as well, but nevertheless, the United States is going to try to get back to the TPP, whether it's in this administration or the next one, and it's going to have this problem, which is, it started with a really good arrangement from an American standpoint, and now it's going to have to get back into trying to negotiate that same situation. All right, so the bigger picture, this routine trade policy stuff, and these newer ideas, I mean, not some new ideas, but newer incentives and, and mechanisms, Routine trade policy like that really can't address the major long-term issues in U.S. Asian trade, and neither can I, so uh, just some say a things in broad terms of that. I don't see, personally, how the United States can really pivot away from Asian The mutual economic interests between the United States and Asia are just enormous and far too important to try to rearrange gravity of economics in any sense, if you even try to do that. And they're going to continue to move. And that's just a fact that, that the Americans and the, and the Chinese, but the countries in Asia, are going to have to try to come to grips with it. At the same time, it seems to me, you can see lots of evidence of this in, uh, in public and private statements in the United States and Europe by corporate leaders that the enthusiasm of international businesses for operating in China is slowing down pretty rapidly. Partly because the economy is slowing down, to be sure. Partly because wages are a lot higher, to be sure. And it's, I think a lot of it has to do with just finally deciding that the risks you take to operate in the Chinese environment aren't worth it. And that you're going to find other arrangements, other ways to try to deal with, uh, with getting into the market. And China, as a result to me, faces a potential area of error of, of lagging competitiveness. Right? It's going to have to try to think. So to me, to both of these sides of this, so China and the United States need a strong and sustainable bilateral economic relationship. And everybody says that. But I think it's, uh, it's important, but not inevitable. And of course, the rest of Asia needs both of these countries to be reliable economic partners. running a business in Vietnam or Hong Kong. It's kind of a crapshoot in many ways. So let me sketch out for you what I see as a semi-optimistic future. I'm actually pretty optimistic about what it means. You may disagree. So given this set of mutual economic interests, how might we see policy evolve over the longer term? Well, one, it may not happen in the current administration, but it may. Uh, the US I think inevitably is going to re-engage in the region. Uh, 
At some point, the government is going to develop a clear strategy for working with the region, with economics at its center. It's uh, kind of remarkable that there's so little leadership in, in, in the government of the United States focused on Asian economic questions. Uh, but there isn't a statement about policy, economic policy. But at some point, there has to be a strategy of that. And I'm not sure that that will overcome it. Of course, the United States uh, is already reconsidering the decision to withdraw from the TPP, and, and then so it will come back and try to attempt a beneficial renegotiation. And the TPP countries that are in the CPTPP, I'm sure, would benefit from the expansion of the market. So the numbers are, without the United States, the sort of economic advantages of the CPTPP are worthwhile, but they're a lot smaller. And uh, to re-engage with regional institutions such as APAC and the Asian Development Bank on, on what might be investment and trade norms in the region, I think uh, there's a lot of scope for that. And finally, continue to address unfair foreign trade practices in the region without <coughs> violating international commitments. This is the sort of important thing to be seen as reliable. <coughs> we have our own domestic investments to worry about. Correct part, China could do a better job of cooperating. I don't doubt that this is under discussion in a big way, uh, but, but, but we'll see. So one thing would be to offer clear signals of an intention to open markets and reform restrictive investment rules and technology transfer policies. Somewhere between really doing that and saying that China will do that is a place where I think the Trump administration is willing to declare victory. Nobody knows where that line is. Uh, but, but, but I think that, that some things going to have to be made uh, public, and I hope that with some commitment there. Uh, certify compliance with existing WTO commitments and, and recognize that uh, China, its eventual designation as a market economy uh, depends on more domestic openness and, uh, than it so currently has. And then there's some scope for collaboration. Maybe complete negotiations between the two countries and a high quality bilateral investment treaty. I don't know if you follow these negotiations at all in this one. Kind of suspended, I think. Uh, but I think in Washington, uh, a signal that would really matter is a bilateral investment treaty with Beijing that really does have enforceable investment protection in it. Address continuing problems of overcapacity that you're all familiar with, invite foreign protection responses, try to avoid that outcome, and sustain a continuing dialogue within the region on expectations and norms in trade and investment. So that isn't just TDP, but the RCEP, and, uh, and you know, the, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, which I know very little about. I'll probably will get questions, and I'll tell you what I can, but, uh, but you know, I'm trying to, 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 to make it clear that, that that whatever that infrastructure being built is, there are expectations about, about non-discrimination and market access in which initiatives of that kind. And jointly between the United States and China, reinforce the centrality of multilateral trading system in several very disputes. But maybe not. It's my last one. <laughs> China could certainly choose to reject this condition of cooperation and uh, continue using market restrictions and industrial policy to try to achieve this dominance that its documents are looking for. I suspect whether Donald Trump is president or not, and whether we're talking about it now or 10 years from now, that would invite uh, more trade policy responses from the United States and increasingly maybe from the European <coughs> Union and Japan. And that would place considerable stress on the multilateral system. Perhaps even encouraging that to work out with the WTO, which is something I think we all do to do. But both the United States and China and the region stand to lose considerably from that outcome. So I will say something that is obvious, but needs to be repeated many times over. Trade wars are not good and not easy to win. I don't have any prediction about which of us might win a trade war, other than to say, if you understand the economic logic, the United trade wars, we're all going to end up with a lot less trade and a lot more headaches. So I'll stop there and ask your questions. Thank you.
I'm David Zweig from HKUST. Politics. Um, I guess my question is, um, as I think about uh, these issues and the potential for some solution to the U.S.-China trade war, um, I try to think of some degree of two-level games, not as sophisticated as Putnam was my teacher at Michigan, so um, not as sophisticated as his whole argument, but the basic assumption that you need a domestic constituency, you need to bring along your domestic constituency to win. Um, and, and when I look at Xi Jinping, you know, because that's, I pay more attention to China, so he clearly has an incentive to meet some of Trump's requests, because as you said, it will enhance reform. And there are reforms that he really, we believe, we're not sure he, but there are certainly strong sectors within China that would like to reform investment policy, finance sector, uh, SOEs, all that kind. But yet he faces a very strong resistance, I think, from netizens, from state-owned enterprises, from agricultural sector, all kinds of things. So how do you see this from that level? You know, do either side, or either side, put together a winning constituency? Because now you even suggest that Trump, I thought Trump had a winning constituency, and now you say that, in fact, he really doesn't. Um, so. How do you solve this? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I, mean, I think strictly on the issue of this concern about Chinese industrial policy and high tech, and Trump does have a consistent constituency, which is essentially the entire American government, the entire Europe, and Europe as well. So that issue has not been going away. Right. And I, I, I think it might, this is, again, strictly my, my take on the issue. So you think they want to take that question seriously. Um, as far as organizing the rest of uh, Chinese economic uh, and political interests, I don't know much about it. Um, I think that there probably has to be some statement that in some future time, China will, if it does, goes through these reforms, achieve these objectives, and become a regional or global leader in setting international trade. So that may be the kind of political document that would work. Nothing like that would work in the United States. Uh, so I think you're going to see sustained pressure on these particular specific questions. But it's not in the United States about being highly protectionist just because we want to be. I think that's where that's not likely to be sustained. So, not a very good answer to your question, but uh, I think it's a hard one. I mean, can I ask you a China question rather than the US question? Uh, I would like to ask. Actually, one way to solve the U.S. trade problem is to to lower the uh, U.S. dollar, right? The uh, um, uh, Trump administration has been talking about the dollar. Would that be one of the solution? And, and this question number one. And question number two is, uh, would the U.S. Uh, trade protectionism against uh, China push uh, China into developing a regional, I mean, say, one bad one row, or you know, uh, uh, more type of Russia, or, you know, Things like that, also a regional uh, trade uh, region, rather than and seeking uh, an easy option out to give up uh, in this trade uh, policy to the USA government. Well, on the exchange rate question, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's still that the United States is committed to fully building exchange rate, uh, that it doesn't view it as a way of generating competitive advantage in trade. Um, I'm a little surprised that on occasion uh, Treasury officials or someone will talk up the value of the dollar. It seems a little odd to me. But the dollar is rising uh, these days, I think, in part because interest rates are rising. They're rising because we've had this tax reform that sort of puts a lot more uh, investment into the system, if you will, less savings. I, I, I'm, this is sort of some, something I was kind of alluding to that's surprising about you know, the policy of administrations, they don't seem to think across issue areas terribly well. So the tax reform, uh, for reasons I just mentioned, is going to, in my mind, over some period of time, raise the value of the dollar and generate a bigger current account problem. Um, and in that context, that might actually increase some pressure in Washington for more trade protection. I, I, I that's just, just, a, just a, a guess. And 
what, but again, in terms of your, your, your question, I don't really see even a mechanism other than dialogue for the United States to try and drive down the value of the dollar and make that matter in terms of bilateral trade with China. So I, I, don't, I just don't see that as a solution thing. Um, so is the Chinese reaction to American and maybe European pressure going to be to try to dominate the region and erect, erect its own sphere of influence and whatever norms that might suggest? Uh, I don't know. It certainly might be a reaction that, uh, that could happen. I think other Asian economies would be a little cautious uh, about that outcome because uh, you know, if that ends up with effective exclusion from the European and American markets, that's not a good thing. If it ends up with, 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 with norms and rules that uh, are a little bit less market-oriented, then that's not necessarily a good thing. But my own take on this, and you know, it's, 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 it's possibly naive, is that ultimately these two massive markets need each other for lots of reasons. It isn't just comparative advantage, it's also size, it's also sort of potential once we get beyond these current stresses for technological cooperation and dealing with a lot of global issues out there. Uh, so I think I could say that may be naive, it may be over optimistic, but I, I think it would be, it would certainly surprise me if that was the reaction of the Chinese uh, authorities. I'm here again. I'm a local business. Right. Uh, you stated that uh, you didn't need and you didn't like mixing up national security with our trade relations. No. But the U.S. Defense Department has announced earlier this year that uh, the enemy is now China and Russia. And given that, uh, I suppose, very few people who believe that China was separate national security from the trade relations. That is certainly not reflected in the 2000 years of history. Now, and if, I would say most people would believe that China may take Trump's threat both in national security and trade relations seriously. So how would you, how would this affect your assessment of, I mean, your semi-optimistic assessment of the future? I didn't quite mean, uh, although I can, I can see why you would have interpreted it that way, I didn't quite mean that they, they're separate. Uh, so much as I meant that security interests would take precedence whenever there was some trade off involved. Um, and so uh, I think that is likely to continue. Uh, and so if the Chinese response uh, to whatever the United States is doing is to sort of tie those things more tightly together, I imagine the Americans respond to this in a similar way. But saying that the steel tariffs or some agricultural intervention or something like that can be done without too much concern about national security is one thing. Saying that uh, the United States is going to just sort of continue with its essentially laissez-faire approach to technology and technological values and export controls and all of these kinds of things. Uh, is another, and I don't, I don't think that's going to be the case. The United States is getting more and more involved in those questions, and so if that matters for your business, well, you're still optimistic. I'm, I am. And again, uh, you, got, you only have very different views of this than I do. I, I just think at the end of the day, the international business community is so integrated uh, across borders, uh, and it's going to be so costly to unwind all of those international production networks uh, and to deal with what would happen if you started going down the road of very regional kinds of trade agreements uh, and highly restricted rules of origin and everything else, which may be what happens, I think it's possible. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, that's just not as likely to happen as the most likely My name is Jim Sitka. I'm a partner in my here at Yongwon. Thank you for your remarks. Um, a question regarding the most recent uh, move by the Trump administration, who is the Commerce Department, banning ZTE, which is a big China uh, technology company, for buying U.S. components, technology components. 
in your view, is this part of the Trump negotiation tactic, or is this simply uh, enforcing Commerce Department rules against sanction violation that they perhaps have been enforcing prior administrations? Well, uh, again, uh, let me emphasize my opinion. <laughs> Only in Washington. I think it's a bit of both. I'm, I'm certain the Commerce Department was making the case that there are some of these enforcement uh, questions involved. But ZTE is one of the Chinese companies that's seen as a rapidly growing competitor. Um, obviously, Qualcomm is not happy <laughs> in any way with the outcome, and this may be part of what I was referring to, but they're now making a very large issue of this case in Washington. Most that, that decision may get reversed, who knows? But uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, that's, you can think of that as a sort of a strategic shot across the bow in this context. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Cliff. I'm a uh, blockchain uh, advisor. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, comment on blockchain, how that might help uh, trade relations, if, if you have any uh, opinion on that. I I only the most poorly informed. So blockchain, I, I assume what you're getting at is the idea that because of these very secure registers uh, that can't be really necessarily tracked by governments, that this could be sort of play trade by reducing Transaction costs a bit. Is that sort of what you're? It can be talking? tracked by anyone. It's public. Mm -hmm. It can be public or private. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So that there's another whole statement on my part. But I, what, what I meant by that is you don't really need to have the sort of intervening little transactions, even including by customs officials, in this context, right? So I, I mean, I think that blockchain could be a real element for expanding trade. Uh, I don't doubt that in getting to that new future that governments are going to be very interested and very involved in trying to figure out how they might be able to regulate that activity, both for security reasons uh, and also for revenue reasons. But uh, yeah, it's probably a, a good future for uh, a long way away in my mind, but I, you, you know the technology way better than I do. Fernandez. I'm a, a Navy student in USC and I'm in Mexico. Um, so my question is about that, uh, naturally. <laughs> um, when you were talking about it, you said like uh, they were renegotiating NAFTA. Uh, you needed an update because of e-commerce, because of several things. And then you said, and some other stuff. <laughs> uh, which I think had uh, like an under-thunder of more political reasons. Could you go into a little bit more detail about oh, that? Well, there's nothing secret about it. I mean, so, so um, NAFTA in the campaign was a stalking horse for all of these issues about trade. So I think the Trump administration is under some pressure to get the agreement renegotiated in a way that favors locating facilities, production facilities in the United States. So what that comes down to is a rewriting of the rules of what constitutes a North American product in a way that favors the United States. So if, uh, I've got the exact numbers because they change, uh, as of some months ago, the current map, if you want to count as North American uh, content, it depends on the product. It's more difficult in textiles, less difficult in automobiles, that's the sort of political economic outcome. But what would happen in manufacturing is if you raise sort of North American content rules from wherever they are now to say 45 to 50 percent, then what the Americans would want is that at least half of that content has to be in, in the United States. So that, that's, a, that's an additional layer of protection or incentive to produce in the United States. This has always been something that Canadians and Mexicans have said. We don't want to go there. Uh, you can understand why, because it sort of eviscerates the, the idea of a free trade agreement in, in an important way. Um, and I don't think they've gotten beyond that point yet. Uh, another issue that I, I think that the Americans have given up on now, should they have the idea, soon is, is the idea that the NAFTA would be subject to revisitation and renegotiation every five years. 
which is very popular in the North American business community because you want a longer investment horizon than that. Uh, a couple of other things like that that are sort of more hidden from the conversation but quite important in terms of getting to the final stage. My name is Shada. I'm from BBVA Spanish Bank. So when you talk about this uh, high sustainability of this uh, protectionism in the US, uh, in your mind, what will be the event of something can stop President Trump? Or like the midterm election, if uh, they continue to be doing this uh, protectionism things, and then they could get punished by this midterm election? Or uh, because so what do we look at the present Trump's administration, we find that before we can do believe some people near to him could affect him. But they now it seems that uh, everyone doesn't have the same idea we can be driven out of the government. So that's why I have this question. So do you have I, I, So governments are terrible at making predictions. <laughs> They're especially terrible at making predictions about politics. So. Who knows? Uh, I think the midterm elections are going to go badly for Republicans. I don't think that means Donald Trump is going to be kicked out of office or anything like that. I'm, I'm virtually certain of the previous four year term. But if the midterm elections go badly for Republicans, he won't have a lot of enthusiasm as the presidential candidate. And there will be uh, other candidates who come along to try to challenge him. And, you know, a lot of people, including myself, have, have, have often wondered if he really wanted the job in the first place. Uh, so maybe that would be a nice outcome for him doing four years and that would be that. But, uh, but who knows? I, I think the thing that would slow down momentum uh, politically for this kind of intervention of stance of trade is a really bad outcome for Republicans in November. Because then what, what the American people would be saying is, um, it, there's so many issues with Donald Trump. <laughs> who, know, who really knows? But, 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 but I think what they'd be saying is that we elected you to sort of change the nature of politics. You haven't. What you've been doing is costly to us. Uh, and so you're going to change years again. Um, but whether that's because of tax reform or just all of the social media stuff that's so strange, who knows? But I think if that. If there's a bad outcome for Republicans, or if it's definitively a bad outcome for them, you're going to see them not supporting a lot of this policy any longer. I mean, Republicans traditionally have been the big business party that has been supporting uh, a lot of the trade agreements out there. And now the fact that they're so willing to walk away from that uh, from the TPP is a big surprise. And I, and I think if you talk to a lot of the senior Republican leadership, they're not happy that that's what they've been forced to do. So probably looking for a reason to go back. Due to the time constraints, now we can only welcome the last question. Okay. I'm, very much, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm Robert Allender from Energy Use Strategy Advisors. Uh, it's one thing to say that the US Americans may be looking inward, but there's one area they can't look inward, and that's the atmosphere. That's well, sure. climate change. Sure. And clearly there are some indications that one of the reasons Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement was that they felt it was bad for the US economy. But, and they've begun to make it more difficult to import solar panels. And other countries like India have seen, well, that works, so we'll do the same thing. Um, do you think that it was a trade issue? And do you think that the US will go back into the Paris Agreement? Well, I can, uh, for just five seconds, put my old State Department hat back on, because at this point, I would be required to point out, to correct you on something, <laughs> the United States has not pulled out of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement uh, is due for renegotiation, believe it or not, right after the first, the end of the first four years of the Trump administration. Uh, and the United States is still in it until that time, at which point, President Trump says, if we don't get a much better deal, that's when we'll pull out. So, those of us who worry about climate change uh, kind of hope that the timing of that is fortuitous. Um, but having said that, the decision to pull out is both uh, 
a political promise being made and kept to the coal industry. And if you want to think of that as an economic outcome or a political outcome, feel free. I don't think it's in any way going to resolve the problems of the American coal industry. We were out of the Paris Agreement. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it was an economic decision. It's popular in parts of the country. It's very unpopular in other parts of the country. And again, I think this is something that the Republicans have to grapple with in the, in the midterm elections because this decision is not popular in the populated centers of the urban parts of the United States at all. Okay, uh, time to but it has been a very nice talk, thank and you. thank you very much again. <laughs>